Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friend, I'm delighted to welcome Yasmin Abdel Majid to the Storybox. I got it right. Hooray. Well Just done. Me. I get a well done from the author herself, which is amazing. Uh, Yasmin is a writer and speaker on politics, society, culture, and technology. She's also a recovering mechanical engineer, which I want to get into in just a moment what that actually means. An award-winning social advocate as well. Yasmin has published four books with Penguin Random House, which is another incredible feat of achievement because if you're in the publishing industry, you know how hard it actually is to publish one book, let alone four. And she's done four and uh, you're still quite young as well, I believe. So (laughs) even better, Uh, including two middle grade novels. You must be like, Layla, I believe. Is it Layla? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you must be Layla. Yeah. Got it. And Listen Layla, which is now adapting for screen. Listen Layla has recently named Notable Book by Children's Book Council of Australia, as well as the 2022 Honor a Book for Children's African Africana Book of the Year by the Cent. I always these these awards. It's you know, really they, long. Yeah, yeah. They go the on and on and on, on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. Just some people think it's great. That's that's the that's the gist. <laughs> it, it's that honorary mention, you know what I mean? Like it sounds <laughs> yeah. incredible, and and rightly so because it's a tongue twister half the time. <laughs> you have this brand new book out at the moment, talking about a revolution, which people can go and get a copy mm-hmm. of right now. Yasmin, it is an absolute delight to welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today. Thanks for having me, Jay. Thank you so much for being here. You are currently based in the UK, is that right? Yes, I am in sunny London. It is it is totally summer at the moment and the sky is grey, so grey. It's brilliant. <laughs> is it hot over there or is it semi-cold still? Oh, listen, um, you know, we got about two weeks of mid-20 20, 20 sort of degree Celsius. And, you know, as soon as any, as soon as the temperature goes above 20 degrees, Londoners take their shirts off. Like that is the energy. And it is really like, I remember my first year here, obviously growing up in Brisbane, I was like, are people like, are they unwell? Like what is happening? Like, what is this epidemic of people taking off their shirts? The, the, the sun has only been out for like three minutes. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's something like 14 degrees today. Um, a good old London summer. <laughs> and how long have you been in uh, London for? So I moved here in 2017, um, but I lived in Paris last year. So I've been in Europe for for almost five years um, and in London for four. Yeah. And how come you moved? You, you've been moving all over the place. What's the reason? Yeah. For you? Do you know, I think I just, I quite like living in different places. I think, you know, I was born in Sudan. My family moved to Australia, to Brisbane, south side of Brisbane, when I was, you know, a baby, a far African baby. You know, we were the second Sudanese family in Brisbane, according to my dad. And, you know, the next one didn't come till 10 years later. And for my whole childhood, like, we had a very, alhamdulillah, very stable, calm childhood. You know, like, we didn't travel around a lot. We stayed in the same, literally the same sort of few suburbs of Brisbane for my, you know, growing up. We'd go back to Sudan every two years just to visit family. And then I kind of, I think as soon as I could, I wanted to have an adventure. You know, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to know what it was like to like live somewhere. I, I remember traveling to Paris for the first time when I was 18, but it was my first trip by myself. And I was like, one day I'm going to come live in this city. You know, I, I remember visiting London, you know, a few years later, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to live here one day. And I think there's just something about, you know, there's so much in the world. There's so much to see in the world. So many adventures you can have. Um, it does mean that I'm constantly having catch up phone calls with people in a weird time zone, either weird for me or weird for them. Like that's just, that's just what happens. I think when you've got friends and family in every corner of the world. Um, but yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. Do you think that you would stay in the UK long-term? Do you think that's like your home from now on or? Well, you know, I think it's definitely a place where um, I could see, like, you know, a whole life. Uh, my partner, and I, my partner, and I are thinking about, you know, potentially spending some time in the US. Um, there are lots of kind of for the work that I do, both literature and screenwriting, television, etc. Obviously, a lot of opportunities in the US. So that's also on the radar. Um, and fortunately, my partner also loves a bit of adventure. So, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens next. 
the reason why I did ask all those questions is the method in my madness. You are <laughs> obviously an advocate and, and for social change and all those sorts of things. Do you find it easier or harder being in the current country that you're in to make mm. more change in the world? Oh, it's a good question. Um, I think so one of the benefits of being in, you know, growing up in Brisbane and being in Brisbane for, you know, my my adolescence um, and early 20s was that when you're rooted in place, like when you have a really strong connection to a place, I think that does help a particular kind of, you know, organizing work. You know, I started Youth Without Borders when I was 16 and I worked on for nine years on that organization. And, you know, I think over the course of those nine years, over the course of almost decade, you know, you get to know people, you get to understand how a place works. You, you really, I think being rooted in a place is really powerful. And so I do find myself in this, you know, now living in London, I've come into an environment where people have been doing social change work for a long time. And so I'm coming in and not necessarily knowing everyone, not necessarily understanding the history and kind of having to do quite a lot of catch up work. And also having to kind of prove my credentials a little bit, which, you know, if you in, in Brisbane, people have known me doing activist and organizing work since I was a literal child. Right. And so you're not having to prove your credentials every step of the way. So there is definitely something about, you know, my ability as an individual to contribute if you're kind of coming in as a migrant, especially sort of you know later on in life. That being said, one of the things that's really fascinating about the UK is that um, you, know, you do have, similarly to the US, I think you do have like movements, various movements that have existed over the years. Um, and so you've got infrastructure, you've, whether it's like the labor unions and the labor unions in the UK have had their own dramas. And that's like quite an interesting aspect of understanding how change works. Um, but you've also got like decades of black organizing and, you know, decades of um, post-colonial work and people coming from lots of different parts of the world and so on. So I think that personally, it's quite enriching being in the UK because I, as like somebody who was born in Africa, have access to a lot of knowledge and expertise and um, community here that I didn't have when I was growing up um, in Australia. I had to do a lot more, I guess, like discovery. Um, and, you know, I as an early Sudanese migrant, we were kind of laying some of the foundations really for for the Sudanese community in Australia whereas here I'm kind of like stepping into stepping into a world that um has been established for some time what does success look like to you oh um that's a, something that's changed a lot for me over the years um I think I'm somebody who cares a lot about having impact and um that means that you know doing doing work where i can kind of see the difference that it makes for people and obviously like having impact on a large number of people is like wonderful but ultimately it's not necessarily i think i'm quite I'm quite careful to like not want fame for the sake of fame or notoriety for the sake of notoriety. I really want all the work that I do to have a sense of purpose. Success looks like living a life with integrity. Um, success looks like consistently improving, um, getting better at my craft, um, learning from, you know, the previous mistakes and, and failures and challenges along the way. Um, and honestly, it looks like being able to come to the end of my life whenever, whenever that is, inshallah, and, and saying like, you know, I had a lot of fun um, and I did the best I possibly could. And, you know, um, and the rest is, is out of my hands. I was listening to a podcast the other day, uh, Bear Grylls telling like wh the, when he wants to get to the end of his life, he wants to come sliding in to the gates of heaven <laughs> and just say, hey, I made it. What an adventure. I did it. <laughs> so yeah. Like, what a like, great visual. What a great visual. Yeah. I know. I was like cheering when I was, I was on yeah. the run and the moment <laughs> I heard that bit, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I do love that. I did like a little bit yeah. of a kick, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you mentioned in making an impact and, and obviously bringing about change for obviously good. 
What does that impact actually look like from more of a, a picture standpoint? If we're to give young people, especially a, a picture, like a, a broader sense of what that impact really looks like, what that change actually is, mm. be able to share, please. Yeah, I think again, that's something that's changed over the years. Like I think when I was working with Youth Without Borders, you know, I wanted to be able to literally give young people the skills and the space to be able to like, you know, create the projects of their community that they wanted. So we started, you know, Spark Engineering Camp, which was an engineering camp for young kids from, you know, historically marginalized backgrounds to come to university and learn about it and so on. Or we like set up mobile libraries in different parts of the world. And we got, you know, different people to kind of work together because I, I didn't want to replicate what was already out there. I was like, how do we pool resources so that we could get people to work together? Um, so like in the, in the kind of like organizing and community aspect, impact really looks like, am I actually making people's lives better? Am I, you know, opening, am I broadening their horizon somewhat? Am I giving them, them an opportunity they didn't have before? I like, you know, every year I will try to mentor, you know, a handful of people in whatever area it is, whether it's, you know, community organizing or writing or, you know, just kind of something else that I might be interested in that particular year, I try to sort of set aside time to be able to, you know, have a chat with them, give them some guidance, you know, perhaps make some introductions that are useful, that kind of thing. I think at the moment today, you know, the really interesting question for me is as a writer, what does my impact look like? Um, honestly, I think part of that for me is, um, is my work having an, having any sort of tangible impact on the conversations that we're having, you know, in the public. So um, one of the essays in the collection is called In Defense of Hobbies. And I talk about not wanting to like monetize every you know, aspect of my life, like not needing to have a side hustle, not, not needing to turn every single hobby of mine into a side hustle. And an impact of that kind of essay is, you know, people reaching out to me and saying, hey, your essay really made me think. And it's meant that I'm you know, I've made this particular choice or, you know, this this thing that you wrote gave me the, the courage to be able to do this thing. And so, I mean, one of the challenges of being a writer is you never really know what impact your book is going to have, right? Because people sit with their book um, and they, you know, they read it and then they go off and they don't necessarily write back to the author, oh, you know, this is the impact that, <laughs> you know, here's the report. Um, so you kind of, you, ju you just have to hope that um, your work is is changing people's lives in some small way. What was the hardest part about you writing this book in particular? Mm, I think that like, you know, talking about a revolution is a collection of essays from the age of 22 to 30, right? So like, I had to be able to kind of accept that my 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 very early work, the first piece of writing that I ever put out into the world was going to be sitting alongside, you know, my most recent writing. And that's kind of hard, right? Because you're you're like, oh, that that first piece or those first few pieces, it's a little bit of cringe because obviously you've improved a lot and you've grown up and you're no longer 22. And fortunately, you don't think like a 22 year old anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, you kind of you see yourself grow over time and you're like, oh, bless. Um, and so there is, there's, a, there's a bit of like cringe factor kind of putting it all next to each other and being like, oh, wow, people are going to see like the the early versions of myself um and and that's quite like exposing in a way and um it makes you quite vulnerable in a way but I guess the flip side of it is that like it's also quite humbling and hopefully reassuring for people because it's like you know you can improve over time everybody starts somewhere you know like my yeah and 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 hopefully that gives people you know a sense of encouragement I mean I also was really you know, I, I, I tackle some pretty challenging ideas. I tackle, you know, the concept of giving up citizenship. I talk a lot about my relationship with my faith, Islam. You know, these are challenging ideas that I don't think people talk about a lot in the public space. And so I was like, okay, if I put that, I put this out into the world, how are people going to react? I don't actually know. So yeah, that was tricky. What does your faith mean to you? What does my faith mean to me? Um. You'll have to read the essay. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I might already have. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I think, um, I mean, for me, my faith is the way that I 
lead my life. You know, it is um, it helps shape my understanding of the world. It helps kind of ground me. It connects me to something bigger than myself. Um, it provides me the strength to be able to get through things that I feel like I can't actually get through on my own. Um, and I think it provides a sense of like perspective um, because I, because, you know, when you really get down to it, like mortality and all these existential things are, are quite, you know, it's, it's tough to sit down um, or it can be challenging to kind of sit down and uh, consider all those very big questions that we don't have answers to. So I think my faith helps me make sense of the world. What's one of the main questions that sort of, I guess, makes you think a lot about life and your faith? Mm, I guess the a big one, right? Yeah. (laughs) Mortality is definitely a big one. I think for me, um, What I spend a lot of time thinking about at the moment is, you know, what is the world that we're going to build together going forward, right? Like, I think if you kind of look at the political trends across the world, you know, we're trending towards authoritarianism, we're trending towards populism, we're trending towards, you know, people taking away rights um, that have been fought for many decades ago. And that's, that's, concerning you know to put it mildly and so I guess the question that I have is like well how are we going to what does it look like to have a more progressive world to have a fairer and safer and more just world and what how do we get there like I think that's what I mean that's kind of what this book is about it's like how do we get to a world that is fairer and safer and how do we get people on board and how do we do that in a non-violent way and you know um, I don't necessarily know the answer, um, but I feel like we kind of, we, we need, that is what I feel like we need at the moment. Do you think that we can ultimately get to that particular future that we, I guess, dream of having where everyone is sort of like on the same page? Or do you think that everyone is just going to be constantly divided over different issues? I think... I have to believe that things will get better. And I have to believe that, you know, that so-called promised land is somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I am also not naive enough to believe that that's like a fixed destination. I think that um, the process of working towards that in itself gets us there, if that makes sense. Um, And, you know, I think that it might not look like what we imagine it to look like. So I, I think that, you know, I'm... 31 this year. I'm definitely a millennial. I don't know what the world, you know, your generation or like the generations coming after, what world will they build? What ideas will they have of the world? I don't actually know. And I think that's really interesting. I think the kinds of solutions, I mean, the kind of world that um, I see, you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds thinking about today is fascinating to me. And so I guess that like, there's this, um, there's a kind of excitement to be like, oh, what is coming up next? And do we, you know, will the answers come from someone like me? I don't know. Maybe not. Some things, I will be honest, excite me, while other things are kind of scare me half to death. But then again, yeah. I'm sort of like, like you, I've got to hope that those mm. things that scare me half to death will get better What's, eventually. What scares you half to death? Um, I guess politically. <laughs> <laughs> mm, like yeah. the whole divide with with that. I mean, especially mm. just in America in general and then here in Australia, you've got two sides and then I don't know if you've noticed the same thing, but over the years it's just got progressively heated even more. Yeah. And I think like the other thing is people, there are a small group of people that are making money from that division and that are, you know, getting power from that division. And I think that's the thing that we have to be able to figure out how to transcend because, you know, um, the, and it's, it's become cliche to talk about the impact of social media, but certainly the kinds of, you know, the, the, 
what social media platforms incentivize are more division. And if we live in a world where people are constantly being pushed to be divided and political leaders are actually you know, pushing us to be divided, then of course that's going to be the world that we live in. So we, ha- so I think like, you know, part of this next kind of phase is figuring out how we get, you know, how we get around that, how we come back together. And that is, that is the real challenge, you know, how we sort of do things collectively. I think, it's really interesting in the UK at the moment, there are these big strikes, you know, um, the rail rail workers are going on strike and, you know, barristers are going on strike. And you know, we, this country hasn't seen strikes like this, collective action since the 80s, right? So it's super interesting. And it's also exciting because it's like, oh, people are coming together for the first time in a very long time and not against each other, but actually against the people who actually hold the power. And I think that for me is really exciting. I think we do need a lot of leadership changes happening Mm -hmm. in across the globe, like not just in one particular section. Mm -hmm. And then we need good leaders that come up and bring about the right kind of change that we, mm. I guess, hope for. And I, I guess that would be my hope and, and mm. I guess as well my prayer that that eventually does happen. And it's all, it's great to see like people actually using their voice. Mm. It's great to read books that the kind of change that I desire and I think about. I mean, there's only so much that I can do, but I can still do something. <laughs> oh, totally. And that's really important, Jay. Like you, I think it's really important that we don't underestimate what each one of us can do. You know, um, I was literally just having this conversation with a friend recently because it can, we were sort of talking about how overwhelming things can feel, right? And how these problems are so large, like climate change and patriarchy, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, well, actually, rather than trying to think about changing the world, what is it to change the world around us? You know, the world that we live in, you know, the relationships with our friends and our family and so on. And I think if we, if we, if each one of us tries to do just that, well, collectively, that's, you know, that is a revolution. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, the challenge for us is we live in a world we, where we can get information about every single bad thing that's happening in every corner of the globe all at the same time. That's quite overwhelming. That's like not a normal thing to be able to to handle. You know, our brains are like, what? Um, And so by kind of bringing it down a little bit and reminding us that it's okay just to focus on like the world around us, our community, you know, the place that we're living in, um, that is totally more than enough. What if you face like blowback and resentment and hate towards your ideas? What do you do then? Well, I guess that you have to be able to, or one has to be able to differentiate between like resistance to change because people don't like change or they don't like you versus like actual constructive criticism that is interested in like getting towards the same outcome, like a fairer, safer world. Um, But sort of saying, oh, the way that you're going about it might not be quite the right way. I mean, I am no stranger to, you know, blowback and resentment and hatred, et cetera. Um, And I think what I have learned is you've got to keep your eye on the ball. Like you've got to keep, you've got to be very certain about what it is that you're trying to achieve. What is the, you know, if there's a specific campaign or a specific policy change or a specific, you know, even if it's as simple as like you you have, um, a new building in your area and you want that building to be like built sustainably rather than being something that's really polluting, you know, like, and you're, you're fighting to them to make that happen. And the development um, organization is like pushing really hard and the council is pushing really hard and everyone's saying that you're a terrible person and you're like, Oh my God, nobody likes me. And it's like, no, no, this is, this is what happens when people try to change things. Like, Folks are resistant to change, especially folks with power, especially if they think you're taking their power away. That's just part of the deal. What you have to do is, one, stay focused on what it is that you are trying to achieve. Number two, have people around you that are going to be able to hold you, you to support you, but also hold you accountable in case you are actually making mistakes and they can help you figure those things out. Like if, if... 
you've got to have the right advisors, so to speak. And three, you've got to figure out how to refill the cup, right? Like you can't just be fighting all the time. Like what is, what is bringing you joy? What is, what is like bringing laughter and lightness to your life amongst all of the blowback? Um, because you need that too. I think you can, it'd be good to distinguish between what is constructive criticism and feedback versus someone just out, out to get you. And mm. that comes that comes with experience. That comes with obviously wisdom too. And it comes with the right kind of people around you telling you, hey, you should listen to this person because they know what they're yeah. talking about. Because I actually agree with them. And if you love and trust that person and they're telling you the exact same thing you don't want to hear, then maybe they're on to something yeah. at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So it's Definitely. kind of like a massive uh, uh, ego deflation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's really important, right? Like you've got to have the people around you that that you know are going to do it kindly, but are gonna are gonna be straight with you, right? Like, and I think that's re- it's actually the it, it's hard. Like the the more successful you are, the more kind of power you have, the less likely people are going to tell you what they actually think, right? The less likely you're going to have people that because people they sort of a they they want to be close to power and they want to be close to success, but also B, they worry about, you know, what will happen if I'm really honest, right? Like, I think that's like a real dynamic. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So I think like making sure you've got good people around you and also like being, I think one of the things that I have learned a lot over the years is like a real, um, self-awareness or trying to get better perhaps at being self-aware and being, of really asking myself, why am I doing this? You know, am I actually missing something? Like, how can I check and verify, you know, how I feel about this particular thing? And it's okay if you sit down and after like some introspection, you're like, hmm, maybe I did screw up. Um, that's fine. But I, it's okay for me to admit that. Like, it doesn't actually make, it doesn't actually take take anything away from me to sort of admit that maybe I could do something differently or whatever it might be. What's your current why? My current why? Yeah. Um, like why I do What keeps everything. you going? Yeah, what keeps you going every single day to do what you're doing? I guess. Um, I suppose... I think about that as con- quite connected to my faith, you know, like I, I feel like I have been very, very blessed alhamdulillah, with the kind of opportunities in my life, with the, with the place that I have in my life. Um, and I see it as my duty to, to give back and to, to sort of make the most of the life that I live. Like, you know, we, we were talking about Bear Grylls, you know, feet first into heaven earlier, sliding. And I think for me, I remember somebody asked me once, like, you know, how 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 will you know if you've succeeded in life? And I sort of jokingly was jokingly was like, if I make it to heaven. Um, but I think there's there's definitely something about living, you know, your life to the fullest in every possible way, making sure that I have, you know, in whatever it is that I'm doing, I make I'm making certain that I'm having a positive impact. And ultimately I want to leave this world, you know, hopefully a fairer and safer place or doing what I can to make it a fairer and safer place for as many people as possible. Which I love and I, I relate with completely because uh, I want to do the exact same thing. I might do it a very different Yay. way than you do, but I think we still have the same goal in mind at the end yeah. of the um, so I wanted to ask you about your your new book, talking about a revolution. When you have the word revolution on the front cover of a book and it's a title, uh, usually people are like, okay, what are we, what are we talking about here? Mm. Um, what sort of revolution are we actually talking about? It's a great question. I think there are two elements to it. One is like a personal you know, a personal change and transformation. You know, I use the phrase like change and resistance and transformation. Um, and so one is about looking like within ourselves. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's what we've been talking about. It's being able to self-reflect. It's being able to 
to check our own ego. It's being able to ask ourselves, you know, what is it, why is it that we're doing things in the world and so on? And how, how am I personally contributing to a fairer world or perhaps a less fair world or a less safe world? Um, and I guess at a societal level, I guess, you know, the revolution I'm talking about is I, I do want us to move to a world that is fundamentally different from the world that we live in today. I want us to, to live in a world where the base values are around justice, you know, are not around just profit. I, like profit is fine and making and creating wealth is fine. And, you know, all the, I think the value system that exists today there are parts of it that have merit, but ultimately I don't think the value system that exists in the countries that I have lived in today are ones that care about us all, right? So I'm interested in what does it look like for us to, to build a world that actually cares about the people that live in it, um, that, you know, that has justice at its core. And I mean, these are sort of big lofty ideas, but really it means, you know, what does it look like for, I mean, one of the essays is about prison abolition. It's like, what is it, what does that actually look like on the day to day? And how can I bring those values in my day to day life? You know, what does it look like for me to think about having power, but not being oppressive to other people? Um, so I guess the revolution is one where hopefully, you know, it's it's not a world where people are, are scared and overwhelmed, um, but it's a world where people feel free to be who they want to be and, and find collective power. And, um, and it's, as I said, a fairer and safer and more just world for all of us. When we're talking about the abolition chapter, for example, what comes to mind for me is not just social justice and social change, but actual justice. Mm. Uh, both of them part of the same coin or are they two different things? Well, I think what's really interesting about the conversation when it comes to like prison abolition and so on is, and what I try to kind of like draw out people is that in our current understanding, you know, we see, you know, if somebody does a crime, we think, okay, that person should be punished. Um, and we call that justice, right? Yeah. We essentially equate punishment to the idea of justice. And, you know, and this is something that comes, I think, from, you know, my culture and, and my faith system, it's like, well, okay, if somebody has stolen my bag and I want to throw that person in jail, that person, I don't actually get my bag back. I just feel a bit better about my loss, right? And so it's this really interesting question. What actually are we trying to achieve as a society? Do we want, is the ideal outcome for me to get my bag back and that person to take some responsibility and us to move forward? Or is the idea that is the ideal that I don't have a bag and that person loses X number of months or years in their life, right? And so I think what I'm trying to do is to get us to think differently about what, how do we make, how do we hold people accountable? Because people will do things that are harmful, right? And they will abuse their power. And like, that's a very real thing that we have to be able to, to grapple with as a society. But the question is, what is the best way to hold people accountable? Are we punishing people because that punishment actually makes you behave differently? Or are we punishing people to make ourselves feel better and to like not have to deal with the problem? I know getting smacked as a child didn't necessarily change my behavior. It just made me you know, a little bit more afraid and a little bit more sneaky, right? Like that's ultimately what, what the punishment led to. But if, if the conversation was, okay, you've done this bad thing, you need to take accountability. Um, and how are you going to behave differently in the future? And it's a trusting conversation, perhaps, you know, perhaps my behavior would have changed. So I guess that's what I'm trying to push us to think about. It's like, you know, we, we have to change our thinking because honestly, right now, I like we politicians will talk about law and order and getting more police out onto the streets and, you know, um, and using more like like violence from the state. And I don't actually think that's making a safer world for us necessarily. And so we need to think differently. Yeah, we saw that uh, not just in Melbourne, but in Sydney and all that kind of craziness. And it was just sort of like mm -hmm. live in this so-called free state, free society, but we can't you know, peacefully protest and it's like, yeah, I get you're going to bring like the army out. Like what, what, what is this? You know, yeah, I, I get it was during a pandemic, but still like they weren't harming 
anyone anyway, like the, it's just, it was complicated matter. I know like. <laughs> yeah, just, no, but I, yeah. I think you're onto something, Jay. I think it's like, you know, we, the relationship between people and the state should not be like one where the, the state feels like just more and more and more violence will force people to behave in the way that they like will force people to comply. That has never worked historically. Oh. Right. Like, and, and yet people, you know, governments continue to try to do it. They continue to think, I mean, authoritarian governments around the world have been like, let's just put more guns on the street. Let's just put more military, power. let's just put more. And you're like, when has that ever worked out? Well, that honestly just leads to harm on and leads to division and leads to anger and frustration and sadness. And so, you know, I think I, the first question is, how do you build trust again between, you know, the different parties? And then how do you kind of move forward? I like these are not easy questions to answer, but I think the the questions we're asking will help us get to a better outcome for sure. Yeah, well, definitely don't take away someone's right to freedom. That will yeah. Is- Right. You just see a massive explosion no. <laughs> for mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. There's nothing exactly. worse than sort of caging a person and their right to choose between some things. Uh, it, it's just not, it's a, it's a point of contention. And that's what I saw with uh, the whole issue with Australia and the lockdowns, especially mm. because we had barely any cases. We had mm. the strictest and harshest lockdowns in the whole world, mm. and sure, I'm all for, you know, helping our, our brothers and sisters community and that sort of thing. But it just got to the point where it was a bit too much and they kept, mm. na- it was like the nail on the coffin. They kept beating it mm. down until eventually what's going to happen. Like you hit mm. the nail too hard on, on, on the end of the coffin and it's just going to... Mm. Yeah, I, I really, yeah, I really feel like I think that's really, um, it's really interesting with Australia because I think you're right. Like, it's the the number of cases were, you know, in London we had over a hundred thousand people die from COVID. You know, we had there were days where there were thousands and thousands and thousands of cases every single day. So, like, you can regardless of how you felt about the lockdowns, you could kind of see the logic, right? And even though here, like, to be honest, I'm not sure how I feel about lockdowns generally. Um, I feel like it's not actually something that I've I've kind of, it's something I've accepted, but it's not something I've necessarily sat down and kind of thought about deeply. But what I will say is that like in Australia, it seemed to me like um, there was this really heavy handed approach and there wasn't this kind of trust, like um, a sort of adult relationship between, you know, government and the community to be like, um, this is how we're going to get through this together. I mean, again, I'm looking at this all from the outside and I'm sure everyone was doing the best that they could. But what I sense now is that there's a lot of, you know, resentment and a lot of like unhealed emotion um, within communities. I don't know how that's going to, you know, I don't know what, what, what form that's going to take in the future, but it's definitely something that people need to kind of reckon with, right? Yeah, just don't lock us down again. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise you could be in uh, a lot of trouble. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't, you couldn't leave the country. That's pretty wild to me. Like the yeah. fact that people couldn't leave or come back, like that's just nothing like that happened anywhere else, you know? Yeah. It, I mean, apart from maybe China, like in terms of restricting people coming in and out, but like, you know, Australia is not an authority. It's not technically an authoritarian state in the same way that China is. So it's like quite, um, it's quite something, isn't it? When we have lockdowns that are comparative to a communist state or country, then something needs to be. Something's up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah something's definitely up with that. Were then, you, um, were you in Sydney for most of the lockdown? I was, yeah. So both of the lockdowns, the first one wasn't so bad. Everyone was sort of like, okay, fair enough. We need to do Mm. what we need to do. The second lockdown, however, that was a different story altogether because that Uh, one was just absolutely crazy. I mean, saying to people that you can only have an hour of exercise a day, how are you going to police that? First and Mm. foremost, you can only go out for a, a select period of time. You can't go outside of your local LGA of concern, they called it. 
And it was stupid because you'd be in one particular suburb at the moment you cross over to a, uh, cross over the line to a different suburb, you're automatically out of bounds, so to speak, and you can get fined or um, you can get in trouble. You weren't allowed right. to leave the house unless you were exercising without a mask. But even then, it's oh, sort of right. like, how, how do you officially police that? Mm. Um, there are all these things, right, that just made me mm. wonder, especially what is going on here. And and the mass, the mm. mass push, you weren't allowed to have any of your freedoms back unless you got a particular vaccine in your arm, mm. say that you were quite worthy enough or safe enough. Mm. But what ended up happening? Everyone just got it anyway. It's sort of like... You know, it just mm. made me, oh, you're right, right, right. Yeah. It, it just made me question. I mean, like you're taking I like away it was really their frustrating. choice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. It's like what you were saying, trying to build back up that trust again with with mm. the community. Um, and yeah, it, it is a difficult thing to wrestle with. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy. And and I think that like what you're also pointing to is like you know, when people feel like things aren't done for reasons that they can understand, like you, you, you can feel like quite resentful of that. Right. Like, I think yeah. if, if a leader stands up and says, we're doing this because of this reason. And like, rather than you must kind of like, listen to us because I say so kind of thing like that, again, that's not a sort of adult to adult relationship, like do it because I say so is like adult to child really, you know? And like, I don't think people like being treated that way. Um, and so I, so yeah, I think that like, it, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, it's been a challenge throughout, you know, many, uh, the United States, I think has had similar challenges and so on, even here in the UK. Although what I will say is in the UK, there are a lot more libertarians. So like the, the government here was kind of like one of the first to lift restrictions and we're mm-hmm. kind of, we're paying for it a little in terms of, you know, the amount of, I mean, I got COVID only very recently, like every Everybody gets COVID in the UK, certainly in London. Um, and that in itself is like a choice I think the state makes that some people agree with and some people don't. Um, but I do think it's just been such an interesting couple of years for, for kind of looking at how different governments operate, what good leadership looks like, and how you can really lose trust um, if you don't treat people as, you know, full adults. Um, that, that, that you know want to be part of decisions being made yeah just treat them like human beings don't treat them like mm. they're caged animals i think that's mm-hmm. important and like actually give support to those that mm. really really need the support the yeah well that's it isn't it is thinking about how do you protect those that are vulnerable in the community as well i think look i I do not envy any of the politicians or the leaders that had Mm -hmm. to kind of make different decisions. I think, you know, it's, it's been a short shrift for them for sure. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we learn from this as well. You know, that's the big thing is like, what, what have we learned from this? Um, because there probably will be another pandemic in the not so distant future. How will, you know, will we go back to lockdowns as a way of dealing with things? I actually don't know. Um, I don't know, you know, th- th- this is not a policy area that I know very well, but I do think that like it's important that we learn lessons from the last couple of years because I don't think people want to go through that again. Well, if history is anything to talk about, whether or not we actually learn our lessons, right? Track, re- <laughs> the track record, right? <laughs> so this time might be different, Jay. This time might be different. <laughs> yeah, there's the the fingers crossed, the prayers up. Like yeah, yeah exactly. Let's hope, exactly. Hope and pray the leaders that are actually in power during that period of time uh, are the ones that have learnt the lesson. <laughs> hopefully, one can only hope, right? That is that is very true, very true. Yasmin, I have very much enjoyed this conversation with you. I've got two quick final questions for you because I know I've sadly okay. got to let you go and have your day. <laughs> uh, but what do you love the most about yourself and your story? I guess I love the fact that I am a very curious person who can never really be pinned down into any one description or or pithy, you know, tagline you know I I love doing things that people might not expect but also I love you know 
in in my life, I have driven race cars, skied the Alps, you know, um, gone scuba diving, worked on oil rigs, climbed volcanoes, uh, learnt to box, the horse ride around Richmond Park. Like I've done, I've had so many adventures, um, and I think that's like so sick that's like a part of my life that I'm really grateful for um and it's something that I hope I never you know I hope that curiosity and sense of adventure never goes away where do you want people to connect with you and and learn more about you get a copy of your brand new book before I ask you the final question um I am on literally all of the social media platforms um (laughs) talking about revolution is like also available online, but you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Yasmin underscore A, on TikTok at Yasmin underscore AM, and on Facebook as well if you are on Facebook and LinkedIn, I guess, if that's your if that's your jam. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm always up for, for chats on any of the platforms, so do find me. LinkedIn is definitely my jam, not so much TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and same with Instagram. But uh, Yasmin, this is my final question for you. I'll make sure everyone knows where to get uh, your book, by the way, and connect with you. Uh, But this is a hypothetical question I ask all my guests Mm -hmm. at the very end. Uh, I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends Mm -hmm. and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Mm, interesting. I would hope that I have lived a life full of love and laughter. I hope that I would have had a lasting impact um, through my writing and my organizing. Um, and yeah, I hope that people remember me as somebody that has been kind um, and compassionate. And, you know, everybody that I have engaged with leaves the interaction happier and, you know, and feeling, um, you know, more joy for it. So yeah, some, something along those lines. The perfect send off message for people. Yasmin, thank you so much for your time today, your your story, your wisdom, your advice, everything you're putting out there into the world and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you, Jay.